Welcome to the IVM Podcast Network. You're listening to the podcast presented by the Daily Pal. This is Pranuti, Amit, and Purva. And we're from The Daily Pow, a city-specific food and culture website. And this is our fortnightly podcast, The The Powdcast. Now, in this episode of The Podcast, we're going to do our annual best of series. So we're going to talk about the best bars we've been to, the best restaurants and cafes we've been to, um, the best movies we've seen and uh, the best plays we've watched. So stay tuned for Bombay Binge. Bombay Binge. So uh, today on Bombay Binge, we're going to talk about the best restaurants and cafes that we went to this year. And this year, like, it's been a pretty crap year overall. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I would think it's that been it, tough. I think it's been it. a pretty crap year for everyone. Yeah. Like and globally, uh, <laughs> globally, yeah, personally, it's just like 2016 really, should be forgotten. Uh, should be forgotten. So, absolutely. But the one thing that has been there, there's been no sort of lack of quantity. Like we list, you know, restaurant openings every week and practically every week there are at least five new places opening. Well, that's true of every year. I think uh, the problem this year is that uh, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of sameness, a lot Mm -hmm. of homogeneity, which is why choosing has become really difficult. Uh, Last year, we had clear winners in each category. So this year comes, as Pranati said, with a lot of riders, each category uh, may have ties. It's really some of the most memorable things that we've experienced that stand out in some way. But Mm. yeah. Uh, But there's also a caveat to each. Right, exactly. So let's start with maybe best fine dining, Mm. you know. uh, And there are not too many fine dining restaurants that open. There aren't. And the the problem is nobody calls themselves a fine dining Mm. anymore, but their prices are all fine dining. Exactly, yeah. So basically you know it's fine dining by looking at the right side of the menu. Right. Right. So we've we've chosen this, well, I've chosen this on on the basis of what is uh, outright fine dining, which is Mask. It's... um, a restaurant that opened in uh, Mahalakshmi to m- a couple of months ago, and um, they only serve now. They have a slightly limited uh, format because they don't have a la carte menus. They only serve degustation menus, which are tasting menus. So you can choose between three and uh, three, six, and ten course meals. Uh, they've just about introduced lunch, where they're also serving two course meals, and I think that's a smart mm-hmm. decision because when you don't have a la carte, you're limiting your audience. But uh, why we are choosing Mask is because they've actually you know sort of care to be different mm-hmm. they are they source they only source locally so all their products locally meaning within india within india yeah. uh, they've you know, tried to stay away from anything that's imported and i think that is commendable a lot of other restaurants are also doing it but they've they've taken it a step further in that they're presenting their ingredients in uh, you know they serve pre-plated food and it's very inventive mm-hmm. uh, very surprising flavor combinations very interesting profiles flavor profiles as well um, overall i thought my meal was great uh, expensive uh, you, you know at four and a half thousand for a 10 course meal which is the one they recommend or you pay three and a half for like a six course meal but with taxes it sort of you know adds up to a lot but it's it's i would definitely say it's an occasion restaurant mm-hmm. and you should go to it once at least and you know? the menu keeps changing so it's never the same it's, it's always seasonal and um they in fact they have their own farms as well so okay uh it's a it's it's interesting each time you go there'll be something new to try what was the best thing you ate while there I mean it's probably not on the menu uh, anymore but well I, I, the one thing that they they definitely always have on their menu is their rye bread now I mean I'm not saying it's the best thing on the menu but it's 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 uh, just they serve it with like these sort of uh, savory butters mm-hmm. and very, very nice bread uh, they also had this really nice course where it was like this apple fritter with robiola sauce all over okay. it and uh, the robiola I'm, I'm guessing like it's locally mm-hmm. made robiola somewhere from this from south they source it from some farm in the south and that was delicious um i had uh, i think out of 10 i had 
six fantastic courses. Okay. Uh, so that's mask at uh, best fine dining. Mask and Mahalakshmi, M A S Q U E. M A S Q U E. Yes. Also, it, it it looks great. It's been designed by Ashish Shah. It's uh, it's it's like so, so earthy opulence is how I like to describe it. So very interesting decor as well, and they do great gin cocktails. Uh, moving on, I guess uh, you know you have to talk about best casual dining. Now this was something that I I struggled with because a lot of uh, what I did review this year falls under this category and um, the two that stand out so there were uh, interesting options there was three chicks and a bear which was launched by the Theobroma uh, the Messman family behind Theobroma they have uh, decent sort of these sloppy burgers but uh, the ones that I'm gonna sort of highlight are Farmer and Sons which uh, opened in Fort uh, it's by Nico Gogawala and why I like it is that it's a bit under the radar I think because of its location in Fort it's located close to um, it's, it's close located to close to the Bombay Stock Exchange yeah, it's and in so, a I mean for people it's familiar with Kala Ghoda it's it's right at the. It's after Nutcracker, right? It's a little yeah, bit ahead. Yeah, it is, of, and it's uh, next to the Forbes building. That's but it's, right. It's slightly obscure. It's slightly tucked away. Yeah. yeah, and um, it's also very small, though. It is. It is very small, and he hasn't really. So, uh, Farmer and Sons used to be Nico Bombay, and he hasn't done much to change the decor. I think it's just mo- mainly has been a rebranding for him. But I tried it as Farmer and Sons, and I think that they do. Um, they have some of the best bread in the city and they do some great, they have a great duck sandwich. Their pizzas are fantastic. They have like this... Um, okay. Well, you wrote about the pita pockets. You really like the pita pockets Yeah, the pita pockets, pockets, pockets are great and they serve it with this uh, house-made aioli. And, um, I mean, in fact, the food is a vast improvement because I, I, I've been to Nico Bombay a couple yeah. of times mm-hmm. um, and that was fairly average for the price right. and also the portions were pretty small. Yeah. Uh, whereas Farmer and Son, it's more value for money yeah. the portions are great and the Prices food is fantastic the yeah. food is like 200 times better than what yeah. it was my only so the only I think problem at Farmer and Sons is it's a very carb driven menu there isn't much rice or anything on, on it but they have interesting bar bites and like I said some very good options if you're a keen bread eater then your pizzas and your sandwiches here are fantastic they also have great salads so check out Farmer and Sons uh, another one that sort of um, I I thought was good enough to mention in this category is the Boston Butt, which is in Kala Ghora. It's walking distance from Farmer and Sons. Um, now, I uh, this has it's sort of replaced Joss uh, in Kala Ghora uh, in that same building, and um, they do uh, you know this this one dish that I've been crazy about again it's bread it's something called the bloom bread which like this sort of their take on this cheesy garlic bread that's great um, but they, it's known for its charcuterie and it's it is uh, so they have yeah and it's interesting because they don't do like you know these heavy sort of big chunks of meat or anything what they they have instead are like these little uh, barbecue bites I would say so it's like small plates but all barbecue with like these nice smoky flavors so they do great jacket potatoes they do like these pork sliders um, they do a great I think I had a, a seafood risotto or a paella, not a paella but something along the lines of a seafood risotto which was fantastic um, very potent drinks a lot of people like them I've had you know one good drink and one not so good drink but overall it's got a nice interesting it gets pretty loud so they've they've also sort of after 11 they turn up the music uh, so all the, all this has to be kept in mind but I liked it I, I did like Boston Butter lots so I think that would be in my casual dining uh, selection uh, coming to uh, desserts now there's always like every year I think we've obviously a city that enjoys its desserts there's been quite a few um deliveries and takeaways just focused on desserts this year there's been Bono Boutique ice cream there's been a cookie shop called Odo Um, there's Cool Story which only does like these sort of heavy dessert like cold beverages Uh, there's also Mama Z's which is again a delivery service that is slowly populating its menu but they started with like pies and stuff but I think uh, the one that gets my vote is Daniel Patissier which is in Bandra, um, this is Daniel actually opened a year and a half ago. They've uh, they they started out as a little kiosk um, just off Hill Road in Bandra. Inside and, Jimmy's uh, kitchen. Inside Jimmy's kitchen, which is uh, Daniel's father. Which is father's. A dirty Chinese place. Yeah, it's a dirty in, Chinese on Chapel Road. 
So uh, Daniel now has a standalone store on in Pali Naka, and they sell a uh, uh, wide selection of macarons. They do a fantastic Japanese cheesecake, which is this really light, spongy, airy. It's almost like eating a meringue. That's the best thing over here. Uh, their macarons. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of macarons because they tend to be very sweet. But Daniel's are fantastic. He does a particularly good. Um, uh, uh olive macaron it's got like this a bit of salty you know savory element to it and they also do like other they do cupcakes and um these other sort of french uh small desserts uh check them out they're very very good and now they are right up the janta they yes just up <laughs> the janta bar so you can splurge at daniel <laughs> and then yeah. have cheap booze at janta amit is uh, making sure to give your landmarks for each of these uh then uh, i think the final category we have is best cafe now there's been so many it's been a year of salad cafes and um hipster cafes hipster cafes there's been just a rattle of some names has been vibes saboro sequel um uh, poetry you'll find all of these on our site we've reviewed all of them and they're all in bandra uh, except <laughs> for saboro well most of them are in bandra there's also been ministry of salads so it's been a big year for salads maybe best salad should get a category on its own but i think that uh, the one that i really enjoyed there's also two one to all good uh, which you know a great place for uh, but that's more like casual kind of, dining restaurant yeah casual dining anyway so it's sort of midway between a cafe and a right yeah no fair point so coming to cafes i think we could uh, it would be a tie between two bandra joints since a lot of it has opened there this would be bad cafe and kitchen garden now let me say that they're both expensive and if you're a big eater then you know you're going to be spending at least 1000 to 1200 per head on salad and juice a, on salad and juice and maybe like a cookie or uh, to have a decently filling meal so that's just a a bit of an issue i had with both of them but they're great if you like you know just a lot of you, they have tasty salads um bad cafe does a little bit is more focused on small plates and uh, they do great coffees kitchen garden has a great vibe a uh, excellent crowd um you know really nice uh, desserts and uh, breakfast sandwiches which are actually only 200 rupees the crowd being bandra hipster let's uh, <laughs> let's I mean, not it's a good place it's a good place to people a lot watch. of yogis so and uh, bad cafe is completely tucked away it's almost always empty so it's good if you just want to go on a quiet date and uh, or if you just want to have a uh, you know decent conversation with somebody uh, that's uh, and it's very minimally designed so they're actually quite different from each other but very similar in their approach to food so i think those would be my tie like they're the tying um yeah restaurants in this category so yeah that's what food looks and like and amit you're going to tell us about the best bars you well, visited this year i think we year. can all talk about best bars because funnily enough uh, the bars that we discussed I think a while ago a few months ago on this very podcast and it was a pow bites uh the three very bars that I think that it comes down to when you think of the best or relatively best bar that was uh, that opened over the last Maybe we should have a months. relatively in brackets yeah yeah, yeah this, and um yeah and the three bars actually are uh, one street over and masala bar which are both in bandra and lima in uh, bandra kurla com- complex yeah. and we discussed these before because what's common to all of these is they actually have some pretty good bar food yeah. which is quite uh, uncommon actually with a lot of bars in the city but like we talked about uh, earlier that you know this is ba- basically it's more of a kind of uh, really like a list not really a choosing of which was the best because while uh, one street over i guess some would say has got quite a great vibe because it's quite crowded it's got uh, you know Uh, a lot of it's quite popular so i mean if you want some sort of you know i suppose it's the most lively of all these three but the problem with it is that it actually has no ambience it looks like a library which is what we said in our review some of the drinks are good i mean uh, you know uh, there are some great of cocktails the food is great i mean it's kelvin chang who you know was with ellipses his i think it's the ellipses hangover, hangover that yeah. truly really worked for it and I, and that's what i would go there for if i want to like you know like some dirty fries or some like asian American uh, 
chicken sort of a mixed food and you know like my pork sliders or a fish yeah. tacos or something so that's what i go for but i i'm not the biggest fan of the way it looks mm-hmm. um but yeah i i guess i would go there with a very pointed yeah. purpose you know yeah. and then you have masala bar which is slightly different i mean it's got a great decor i think out of the three it's got great decor i mean it's only lit by candlelight it's also got this sort of art deco kind of uh, paneling, paneling right? all throughout which actually makes it look quite cool you can't really see what you're eating or drinking but some of the drinks are actually quite nice i mean there's something that they do that's called bollywood bhang which is i you know i actually don't like uh, milk but this was surprisingly nice it was uh, basically it had uh, it was vodka with some basil leaves and you know uh, some sort of uh PG13 version of bhang <laughs> which uh i you know it's it was being sort of slightly milky. i don't think a PG13 <laughs> version of bhang is even possible <laughs> it, it uh, well you know fake bhang and uh, this i mean it was actually quite refreshing and nice and you actually didn't it didn't taste milky and it didn't taste like you know terrible and so it has some of these but again with with the, these guys they do a bit of their whole molecular gastronomy nonsense which i find really poncy and unnecessary and then you have on the other hand you have lima which is slightly far away in bkc i suppose and far again, away for who far away for people who live even in bandra clearly <laughs> <laughs> but uh, amit stays does not stay in bandra if you yeah, have not already figured the, out that's the that's the subtext yes. it's far away for amit who lives in <laughs> but Home again Road. but we found it i think we all went to lima together and we found that the food and drink were great but the again no ambiance whatsoever not yeah, much of a vibe it, you know for a like a peruvian bar i expected it to be a lot more lively but this felt very corporate i suppose because they've naturally yeah, because crowd. it's in bkc so it was full of suits and yeah. also ladies who lunch ladies would come for dinner lunch would come for dinner yeah. but they're everywhere yeah. <laughs> and but some of the things, things we had you had uh, some co- uh, cocktails pisco sars really like, we yeah. had pisco yeah. sars which yeah. we really yeah. liked yeah. which were great which also were great. because there's no other bar in the city there's doing, doing them pisco you know so i think it was and the food was also pretty yeah. terrific yeah 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 so the only drawback is uh, you know a lack of vibe and a pretty Just, pedestrian decor yeah very pedestrian yeah yeah so mm-hmm. again so, i mean it's sort of like a three way tie between these three but none of which each of them have like good and bad things about them but they're relatively better than all the other nonsense bars that have opened yeah. in the city over so you can see how we've been struggling now now you yeah. know <laughs> anyway so we'll be back with the scene hi i'm may and i'm a huge fan of the indie music scene in our country a scene that's relatively underground even though it sometimes speaks its head overground but there's no shortage of talent and i get the privilege of interviewing some of the most awesome musicians on my show i've had the likes of euphoria crush kale hardcore randolph coria i've had singer songwriters folk singers electronic music producers playback singers rappers fusion artists instrumentalists classical musicians and so on whether mainstream or not these people have chosen to release their original music and these are the people current currently shaping the direction in which our music scene is heading join me on my show every monday and tune in to discover the unique talent coming out of india today you can catch made in india on your favorite podcasting app or our very own ivm podcast app the scene In the scene we're going to be um taking you through the best of culture there's going to be a bit of music uh movies plays you know whatever we could come up with so we'll let Amit take the lead Well I'm going to start off with uh basically talking about what I felt was the best Indian independent music album this year um you know this year there've been a lot of releases like a lot of um Uh, I'd say fairly popular musicians have released albums. People like Karsh Kale, Monica Dogra, Scar Avengers, uh, Spud in the Box, you know, Sand Dunes. There are also Duelist Inquiry, Nuclear, who sort of been releasing his album over a series, as a series of singles. Then you know, F Sixteens. They're all sort of familiar names of people who regularly go for music festivals and gigs. Um, but for me, the one album that stood out really was. Uh, 
the album Connected by Don Button, Passenger Revelator. Now, they're an electro rock group from Bombay. And I also want to give an honorable mention to Spud in the Box, whose album uh, Lead Feet, Paper Shoes also came out this year. And they came out like within a week of each other, which is kind of funny in September. And what I really liked about the Spud album is that, uh, you know, when Spud in the Box first came on the scene, I don't know how many, how many saw them, but they had this really sort of pop rock kind of. Uh, you know, um, thing going and they sounded a lot like their influences and then suddenly in between, I don't know what happened to them they went like, they did like a 180 degree turn and they started doing very heavy material and it was like, uh, you know, this band has completely changed, but the album I think they seem to have finally found their footing to you, like you know uh, with this uh, record and it seems like they've really matured and it's it's kind of like a concept loosely a concept album, but what I really like about it is that, uh you know, each of the songs have a proper structure to them. You know, they are, there's nothing... It doesn't sound like anybody else. You know, there are sort of guitar solos and things like that in it. But uh, it's it's very layered, it's very melodic. And I think that it really sort of shows that these guys have uh, taken their time. They seem to have got it right. Um, but what I really loved about Connected is that it's... It's an album that actually makes a statement. Um, I don't know if either of you have heard it <laughs> because nope. it's. Uh, Can't th- say. And if I would like, I, I mean, I'm just the song of the year for me is the title track. It's called "Connected" and it's basically about um, how everybody is obsessed with their smartphones today, <laughs> and you know how everybody is basically, um, you know, just like. Even at gigs, nobody's actually watching the gig. Everybody's looking at it through the through the screen or recording it, and um, you know it's and and the term that uh, Don Butt uses is plastic souls, and it's kind of a nice term to talk about. You know what this the current sort of scenario is like, and I think the irony is when you go for a gig, you will probably see people sort of filming the song while yeah. he sings about it or talking through it yeah yeah but you know the album has got a lot going for it I mean he's got like uh, and uh, I think some of this would also go to the uh, the credit should go to the vocalist on the album who is a guy who calls himself Ty Toy Mob um, and uh, it's also a slightly political album like there's a song called Desh Bhakti which talks about you know everything wrong with like sort of some of the stuff that goes on politically and uh, and there's there's a bit of folk fusion in it there's a song called The Storm which has got like this nice sarangi there's a song um, you know there, there's a slightly harder more aggressive track called Spinning World so there's a fair bit of variety and it's also really moody atmospheric it's really something but it's and best of all I mean it's got all the stuff going on but it's also really catchy so I mean it's only seven songs and I was tempted to sort of classify it as an EP, but my criteria was if it's longer than half an hour, I think I can call it an al- you can call it an album. And uh, yeah, so I think that's the album that really sort of for me was okay. uh, the best of this. I mean, the one that stood out the most this year. What other categories do you have in music? Uh, well, I think we should definitely have a best venue. Right. Uh, and of course. I mean, yes. <laughs> Now that we don't have Blue Frog. No, exactly. I mean, it's been a kind of a sad year for culture. Again, like we're talking about it being a pretty shitty year, but the Blue Frog shut down, the Hive shut down, you know. Uh, so you had like these two big culture hubs just, sh- you know, going away. Or, um, and, you know, I think that anybody who is goes for gigs regularly ends up going to antisocial the most often. Because but anti-social, at the same time, there have been a lot of music venues that have come up this year. Well, not well. really. There's been... Nothing on the scale of Blue Frog. Yeah, but, but I mean, I know that when we do our weekend guide listings, we have a whole bunch of gig venues that we list. Well, there are lots of gig venues, but actually nothing that... Uh, you know, would I would say would be that you can really consider as a bona fide venue. I think the only other one apart from Antisocial, which I think is the best venue of the year, best new venue is Tuning Fork, which, you know, because it's, uh, we've talked about this before. Tuning Fork is a little small cafe. It's in the Hotel Unicontinental in Car. It basically has no, uh, it has a seating capacity for just 50 people. And, uh, now it's sort of just started to do stand up comedy as well and I think they only I, I think they serve beer I don't even know what they serve other types of alcohol and 
what's good about tuning fork is that the, I think the only people who actually come there are people who actually want to watch the gig. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, they don't really have big name artists. They have singer songwriters. They tend to have like you know just the small scale. Even if like a a band does a show, they they're likely to do an unplugged show. But what's great about anti social is that they really sort of come and take in over the kind of uh, stuff that. Uh, Blue Frog used to do so. Yeah. A lot of people who would program gigs at Blue Frog have coming and doing yeah. it at anti-social. And it's great programming. There's a yeah. lot of stuff that I do want to see there, which is I mean I'm really picky. You at least go for a lot of gigs. I'm super picky about what I want to see, and I thought it would be only EDM or whatever. Yeah. And it's not. No, it's not just. I think anti-social is great because a, it has a lot of space. Yeah. Uh, they have great. Well, air nowhere conditioning. <laughs> compared to uh, like Blue Frog, of course, anti-social I think can comfortably fit about 300 people. Yeah. You know, but uh, I've never felt like. Unpleasantly sort yeah. of stuffed. Well, I think that the most crowded night was probably the was, boiler room. Uh, yeah, the boiler room gig, which yeah. uh, or something like a grime ride disco, which they have quite often. Yeah, but uh, even when they had a grime ride disco, it didn't. It wasn't uncomfortably it wasn't crowded. Uncomfortably I mean, I think crowded. and because when you talk about conditioning is pretty yeah, good. Well, and you when I say best venue, I mean it's not just the programming, right? It's also the fact that the sound is great. Yeah. I mean the sound is good the air conditioning works also they they only charge 300 rupees for most gigs now which yeah, is they, what blue frog used to charge when they started which blue i think frog, is great yeah blue frog used to charge 350 on the week during weekdays and 600 bucks during weekends yeah. the only difference is that blue frog used to have a lot of free gigs i don't i don't think anti social really does free gigs right. i think they've decided not to do the free gigs but the drinks are way cheaper than they were at blue frog what do we have outside well, music? Well, there's film. We can um, come back to music. I'm sure Amit has more categories. Well, I think the people can read our best of <laughs> <laughs> lists right. when, we, when we put them up next when, week. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, so in film, uh, funnily enough, uh, I have a Bollywood film. You know, it would be far easier to do a worst of for Bollywood. And maybe that's something we can consider because <laughs> most Bollywood films are just appallingly bad. Uh, but in all the films that have been released this year I suppose one film stands out and if you had to give a film best Bollywood film Just of the year tell us which it, it is would Sons. <laughs> it would be Kapoor and Sons it would be Kapoor and Sons oh I really liked it it was a sweet film yeah I mean and the re- now, now Kapoor and Sons there's absolutely nothing different or revolutionary about the story at all I mean right. it's a very simple family drama but what is different about Kapoor and Sons is that it's well written yeah. It's tightly written. Mm-hmm. So you get a sense of the family dynamic. Yeah. You know, the relationship between the parents and their two sons, um, as well as, you know, the relationship the two brothers have with each other and their relationship with this girl, mm-hmm. Alia Bhatt, who is, you know, living next door. I mean, it's just sort of really tightly written. There are also a couple of surprises, which is very rare in Bollywood films because they're so predictable. You know, you <laughs> yeah. see every turn coming a mile away but here there are actually a couple of moments in which you know you flinch or you yeah. you don't see those moments coming and so that's that's quite well, nice well the biggest surprise is that Prof okay. actually uh, liked giving, uh, have, a, have Bollywood liked a Bollywood film, film. I think By most way, people will be your so review impressed. only gave it three stars it gave it three stars <laughs> now naturally which is gave generous it three stars. by Pranati standards because I mean it's it's a very uh, you know I mean it's a fairly pedestrian story if you look at it but it's well written <laughs> it's well written um, and and it's enjoyable you know I mean you know I, and I think everyone would agree with would agree that it's it's a you know it's a fun it's a fun yeah, film. It's a sweet film. Okay, uh, but, what's um, next? But also, um, you know, best play in the best play category, I would, again, I, I haven't, uh, so I've watched only the big plays that uh, that were staged this year. And by big plays, I mean the plays that were staged as part of the Adhyam series, uh, the plays that the NCPA produced, and a few other noteworthy dramas. So I, again, none of them really stuck out. Uh, you know, to, this is 2016, so nothing in 2016 <laughs> has uh, really had yeah. much distinction. Uh, but you know, I would give it to Loretta, which is um, which has been which, directed by Sunil Shanbag. Now, Loretta is in the style of uh, the theater, and the theater is a gone form of theater. It's it's musical, and what marks a theater out is is that uh, you have a central narrative. And then you have side sketches. And the sketches have nothing to do with the play itself. And it is for these sketches that this particular play stands out. 
not the actual story oh, okay <laughs> so the actual story it's it's like it's a sweet story it's a, you know it's this couple in love they go to goa and his father is um this sort of konkani landlord and he will accept this girl his son's girlfriend only if she learns how to speak konkani so it's about her learning how to speak konkani um so it's it's done very sweetly but the sketches are quite political you know the the sketches talk about censorship in theater they talk about uh, they're a critique of the bjp government and you know this is something that we've discussed on the website that you know unfortunately and, and very sadly the performing arts especially theater is, has been pretty silent about what's what's going on in the country has been silent about um what you know the government is up to and it's really the role and the duty of uh, of of the arts to talk about these things and this is one exception and i think this is why i would give this distinction to loretta that it is one of the very few plays that that talks about what's going on in this country and that is that that is what theater does theater is highly political and um, but don't you think that the play also have a loosely tries to make a connection between it does because uh, you, you know, know what uh, the, those little skits are about and what the play is about which is essentially that your identity doesn't necessarily have to be tied no, to no, language abs- or you know it. and especially when you have a place like it's being staged in a place like maharashtra or a place like bombay where you know um, no, no, we absolutely. have parties like so, the mns and the ship sena and you know doing sort of making this whole marathi manus kind of like no, no, absolutely making... and the play the play the central narrative does this in a in a subtle way because yeah. you have the father who's very hung up on people knowing konkani so he is a goan nativist yeah. like you have maharashtrian nativists in in bombay so it does make that connection but it's you know it's subtle and it's sweet and in the end the father is won over by his uh, future daughter in law and so so that's so so i mean so that's also one great thing about the play is that it ties the narrative with the sketches in a subtle way but the sketches are really what make this play and it's uh, you know I, i've spoken to sunil shanbag about this and this was one of the reasons he did did it in this style to be able to have these sketches and of course the sketches have been written by varun grover who's a lyricist Hindi film lyricist and scriptwriter, and he is also one of the writers of Esi Tesi Democracy, which is a stand-up show that was staged last year, and that's a highly political, very funny and highly political show. Again, very critical of the government. So, so yeah, so that's it for. Uh, best play and i think that's it uh, for the scene yeah because we'll be having a lot more categories in our annual roundup which we'll publish on the site very soon well it will be up on the site by the time this, this uh, podcast, podcast is, out. is out so you can yeah. read it then hi i'm amit verma the host of the weekly podcast the scene and the unseen in my show i examine the scene effects and the unintended consequences of public policy and private action i show how policies meant to help the poor often end up hurting the poor i've done episodes so far on demonetization gst surgical strikes immigration and mrp and i will continue my forensic assault on the truth in the weeks to come Catch the show every Monday on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you prefer or visit seenunseen.in for all the latest updates. Metro station. We're going to end our best of wrap up with uh, Metro station and Metro station isn't really something that lends itself to too many categories as far as you know a year end wrap up is concerned but the one thing that we have found that there's been a lot of uh pop up this year is tour companies conducting heritage walks across the city um i mean th- we interviewed some place else who have been around for a while but uh, also got quite active this year there's um you know another company called rahgir which we uh, talked about the kamati pura walk on another podcast and there's khaki tours who i think we talked about the most so far because they keep doing interesting walks and i think that's the reason why we've chosen them as the best tour company and probably you've been for quite a few of their walks yeah i mean the great thing about khaki tours is that they're very regular mm-hmm. and i think now a lot of walk companies tour companies are becoming regular mm-hmm. uh but khaki tours i mean they have at least two walks every week on yeah. saturdays and sundays so that's great um and what i find not- is that you know the reason why this is happening is that earlier these tours were pretty much rest- uh they they were sort of limited to tourists 
like back in the day where you had like i think companies like bombay heritage walks and whoever would do this if you ever went for the walk most of the time the most of the other people they were tourists now what's happened is that a lot of people are interested locals are interested in city history and if going for any of these walks you'll find a whole bunch of people who are from bombay that are coming for it right and no yeah absolutely i mean people who are you know, local history buffs uh, but i mean let me just draw a distinction here khaki tours is it's a uh, it's not a for profit enterprise it's a bunch of local history buffs who are running these tours something like raccoon tours on the other hand it's mm-hmm. a more commercial enterprise so you will have more tourists mm-hmm. in a lot of raccoon tour walks and those are also more organized in a yeah. sense uh, but khaki tours it was started by a chap called bharat gothoskar and bharat has a day job he's um, he's a suit at mahindra uh, but he's always been into into local history and uh, khaki tours has now grown while he is the principal person there are you know other people who joined him on walks who now lead walks of their own okay. under the umbrella of khaki tours and interestingly they've recently started uh, jeep tours now i mean these are not actual jeeps but like jeep like vehicles and it's like mm-hmm. a 3 hour tour and you go around the city early in the morning to avoid traffic i haven't actually been on one of those but i have been so it's like a safari exactly it's an <laughs> urban <laughs> safari <laughs> oh my you, god you will see buildings instead of wildlife <laughs> exactly so you urban see safari the, is what it's called yeah you can see the But yeah, I mean, I'd rather uh, walk around the city, and I've been for a bunch of their walks. Like I've been for the Parel walk, and uh, I I remember seeing things that I I didn't even know existed, or things that I read about but never actually seen. And this was just a great opportunity to actually uh, to see these things. Now I remember like the one thing that actually that just blew my mind during that Parel walk was this farm that. Yeah. We also I, spoke about it. We extensive. spoke mm-hmm. we yeah. spoke about it on this podcast this farm in uh, Lalbagh and it's a patch of 2 acres and you just stumble across it it's in this housing society so you can't see it from the main road and then you enter the housing society and lo and behold there's this this patch of this field of green um and all of parel's high rises overlook this farm so you can just imagine a builder saying you know wow i need to get my hands on this plot of land but it's been farmed uh, since the the early 1900s by this one gujarati family and people go there and buy vegetables from there and i mean that was that was fantastic and um bharat is uh, you know he has a lot of architects in his tours and so, sometimes these architects take over and <clears throat> as a result the walks become a uh, very you know temple and architecture oriented so they're constantly pointing out you know this frieze here this motif But there but doesn't that make us like esoteric to people not like zone out if you're not you know, really frankly, able to architecture you have architecture. to be really into this kind of stuff like the bhuleshwar walk for example mm-hmm. i don't know how many temples i saw like i don't think i've been to You've so many you've forgotten how many temples i've forgotten how many i went to so many temples like i've never been to so many temples in my life like i never go to temples unless they're of historical and architectural importance but it was amazing to actually go to these temples and some of them were lovely uh but you have to really be into the into architecture and into local history so perhaps some people might have found that boring and repetitive but it's also really fascinating to see how motifs change and uh you know which motif belongs to a particular well i guess era. it also depends on the place right i mean something like parel seems uh it seems to have like a wider range of different things to see i mean i think anybody would be quite yeah, amazed to see yeah i went to a lot of temples in parel as well <laughs> okay but like to see a farm there would be like you know more yeah. general interest yeah something yeah. more general interest to somebody more people would be like into rather than seeing but you know you know, you know it really it really depends on uh, it depends from person to person mm-hmm. if this is something that you like so, then you'll really enjoy so it so is it basically that these guys are more knowledgeable they seem to know i mean uh, a lot of stuff about the city that uh, like the average person does not is that why you like khaki tours what's what what i like about them is that um, they're not experts mm. so they have a little more expertise than you or mm. i because they've read more books but they're mm. not experts mm. so they might be a little fuzzy about dates okay. for example but what's interesting is that uh, it's a conversation that takes place you know someone corrects 
someone will correct mm. go to bharat or the person leading the tour or you know mm. so there'll be a dialogue so everyone's exchanging knowledge everyone's exchanging expertise uh but we also have an sort of honorable mention and it really doesn't fit into any category and i think the reason why we're talking about it is because it's it was an exciting and it's one of the few bright spots of 2016 yeah. the fact that the opera house finally reopened, reopened after being uh, under restoration for many many years right and we, we were all, lucky we the three of us got to see it yeah because actually it hasn't it. opened for the to the public yet they've It's had a series of private, private events, events. They keep having private events uh, almost every weekend but we've talked about you know uh, about going inside and seeing the place yeah, so how. we've talked about it on this podcast and also on the website um it's been done up pretty sumptuously and mm-hmm. uh, you know it, it looks like you know apparently what it looked like when it opened and it opened back in uh, 1912 i mean that's when yeah. it was uh, completed and it was an opera house and then you know there were operas there was a lot of theater that took place over there then for a long time it became a theater a cinema. A cinema films were screened and uh, and there were lots of structural changes that were made, right. made to it over the years which coincided sort of, with film screenings yeah and it sort of was turned into an art deco cinema at from some the in, point from yeah. the inside but it's it's sort of been restored uh, to its original baroque style and uh, so you have a lot of gold leaf embellishments you have cherubs <laughs> yeah you have lots of cherubs <laughs> hamid is obsessed with the cherubs you have uh, this three tiered balcony I'm you have plush red seats by the seats. fact that the girl who took us around kept talking referring to it as a boy yeah. <laughs> but what i really like actually, my favorite uh, you know feature. element yeah feature of the opera house was those little uh, you know domes those little cupolas inside and you had Uh, portraits of musicians Who and Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, so no one I could only no, identify Shakespeare. No, only Shakespeare can we identify the <laughs> yeah. others. Uh, no But I mean, could. it's great because it's it's huge and it's got three levels and. Um, and well, actually, it appears huge from the outside because it's such an imposing edifice. But yeah. from the inside, it's actually fairly intimate. Like, I mean, if you've if you've been to an opera house, yeah, elsewhere, I'm, not, I'm not comparing it to say, the opera houses abroad, but talking about like you know the kind of venues that we have here. Yeah, it is know, pretty grand it is pretty thing. grand but from the inside it's you know it's kind of cozy like you yeah. know we went up to the third, third level and, and the there was the very steep step it was step. very steep you know the seats were so steep and that just shows you how actually compact that place is yeah. and it's, it's nice it would be nice yeah, to yeah and and see it, i mean there. we sort of sat in the last row and found that you can actually get a pretty clear line of vision even exactly so it's it's there. well designed So so yeah so I mean that was the one exciting uh, the local development of the year and also related development. something that you can look forward to next year because they will have a public event starting I think in the middle of January so you can look out for that we'll be writing about them for sure Yeah and yeah so that's it for metro station and uh, we'll see you next year I <laughs> Yeah, we will. There's no doubt. <laughs> You'll hear us next year. <laughs> It's more like it. So that was our best of uh, Bombay wrap up, and you can read much more about our favorite things. Well, relatively fa- <laughs> <laughs> most favorite things of the year on the website. Favorite word this year is relatively. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. For updates on what's going on in the city, sign up for our newsletter on the dailypow.com. Also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram where the Daily Pow and follow the podcast on Savan. If you like listening to the podcast, check out Geek Fruit, hosted by Uber Geek Tejas Menon and Jishnu Guha. The show talks about geek culture from an Indian perspective. Star Wars, comic books, science fiction and fantasy, TV shows and more. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. Sorry to say but there's been a slight delay due to the apocalypse having suddenly begun. As you can see there's death, destruction and chaos taking place all around us. But don't you worry, food and drinks will be served shortly and I would recommend checking out IVM podcasts to get some of your favorite Indian podcasts. We'll keep you going till this whole thing blows over. Thank you.